I'm here in Medjugorje and I'm with, what's your name? Timothy. Timothy, where are you from? I'm from um, Chicago, yeah. born and raised. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I've been here for about six days. Yeah. How did you hear the first time about Medjugorje? What did you think when you heard the story? Um, so I went on my first big pilgrimage last year and I was in Lourdes. Mm -hmm. And there was a young lady I met there, um, Natalia. Mm -hmm. And she really encouraged me to come here mm -hmm. to Medjugorje. Um, and so after that, and after that experience that I had there, I wanted to pursue more of uh, these beautiful feelings um, and come into these sacred and special places uh, to continue like my faith formation. Yeah. Um, so a very special things happened in Lourdes when I was there. Uh, what happened? Uh, I'll tell you because this is a testimony. I keep a lot of this kind of close in my heart and I haven't really shared it with too many people. Mm -hmm. I think of like St. Therese of Lisieux when she would wrote in her uh, The Story of a Soul about the smiling statue when mm -hmm. she was healed. I remember she said she didn't really want to tell too many people other than uh, her sister because sometimes by talking about it, it loses its perfume, is the way yeah. she put it. Um, so there's a lady back home. Her name is uh, Andrea Vincent. She's a widow. Mm -hmm. uh, before I went on that journey, it was my first time leaving the United States. It was a really big journey for me. I kind of shared uh, what I was feeling and my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And she had told me she had been to Lourdes uh, 60 years prior. Mm -hmm. um, she felt bad. I guess she carried it with her for, you know, these last 60 years that she didn't help kind of people that were in need, people that were asking for help and money and stuff like that. So before I left, she gave me uh, some money and she told me, you'll know, you'll know, the Holy Spirit will tell you when and what to do with this money. Mm -hmm. So I got to my last day in Lourdes. I was up in the upper church mm -hmm. and I, I didn't know. I, I wasn't finding the opportunity and I'm running out of time. And it's, uh, I was that night I was going to prepare to head back home. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in church praying. And all of a sudden this gentleman, he came up to me. And I'll never forget, like I noticed his shoes. There was something about his shoes. It was almost like and I had to test it a little bit. I kind of let it keep going like, wow, is this it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so he, he asked me, he didn't really quite get to asking me for help right away, but he was telling me a lot of his story. He was telling me about uh, kind of some of the ways that um, he has had struggles in his life. And so I let it keep playing out, almost as a way to, like, for me to keep testing, like, is this uh -huh. where I'm supposed to help? Uh -huh. um, and I let him get through his story. And at the end, he gets up and he goes and he's going to walk away. And I was like, wait, stop. And I called him back and I had handed him this money. And he started to cry. Um, he got really emotional. He couldn't believe, like, that I actually, like, helped him. I'm sure a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people who are in need, we don't help them. I don't know if you've ever been in this position, but if you're the one who all of a sudden needs help from then all of a sudden, all you see is backs and no one's really there to help you. Um, so as he cried, then I started to cry. And in that moment, the Blessed Mother, mm -hmm. you know, there's the statue. Mm -hmm. But it was almost like out of the statue mm -hmm. in the, like brilliant colors. And she was crying with us. And like, like you told me before, like I heard the voice. Okay. And she's like, this is it. This is, I, I am like true love this is true love you know um so after the experience i get up and i want to like you feel like you're coming down from the mountain after you have an experience like that and you witness something like that and i remember i like kind of want i want you'll never guess what happened i was telling some lady in the church because i'm like shaking and i had this experience and, you know, and she couldn't believe what I was saying, but then quickly it kind of pulled back. It's, sometimes it could be hard to tell when you have these kinds of sacred experiences in your life. Um, and people start to interpret. And this was another thing that St. Therese said when she would tell the story, like to even to her other relatives, those wanted to know more and more and how did she look. And you could get lost in words. In some ways, this is, it's more of a feeling uh, inside. So I was very blessed to have that experience. Um, like here, I've been, a lot of people I've run into, they've been telling me their stories um, of experiences they had. And even the priest today, I mean, he was telling us about a story he had when he was a younger man when he came here. And he was talking, describing like the sun 
and how he was looking at the sun and it became the host and then there were drops of blood going down to the earth mm -hmm. and then it kind of uh, like the host it span yeah and it became the sun again and you know after that he was kind of saying like he didn't need more after that and I don't feel like I need you know blessed are they who you know believe and don't have to see right that kind of a thing yeah when you do get a little taste like what happened to me in Lourdes it wasn't because I was necessarily like looking to have that experience right I mean we all want to have that experience we all want to have our lady talk to us or have you know Jesus or to see these great things and signs and miracles um, but our need and our want is, isn't necessarily going to make it happen. I'm sure some people kind of come to these kinds of places and maybe feel discouragement because they don't have um, an apparition of their own or whatnot. So there was something here when I was walking kind of out in the grass behind the church. This was uh, one night where the sun was setting. And there are these three ladies and the sun was just, it was perfectly placed between these bushes. And the way they were looking at it, and I started to look at it and... It almost seemed like, you know, there's something about the sun here, you know. Um, I could see what the miracle of the sun was in Fatima. I almost could, like, uh, remembrance of it or something like that. Uh, but the sun was almost like it was starting to, like, pulse and, like, get a little bit bigger and smaller, almost like it was breathing. But I realized, again, this wasn't for me. This was for these women. So I kind of, like, stepped back and uh, let them have their moment. Um, there's been other people who have shared their story with me here. Um, I think in some ways, it doesn't have to be so significant like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could be just when you come to like Lourdes or Mejigoria, or if you go to other places, I, I hope to make it to Fatima. I hope to make it to the Camino and walk that trail. Um, I think when you put yourself on a journey, on a pilgrimage, there's something about a movement, and you don't have to go far. I mean, it could just be going to maybe a new church, a church you haven't visited before, or kind of visiting, you know, um, back where I'm from, there's one of the priests, there's a, uh, a painting that's in the hospital nearby, and he told us about it. And he's like, you guys should make this little pilgrimage over there. When I went there, it's a very, very special painting because the woman who painted it, she got, it was a painting of, Jesus Christ and she went to sleep she did the eyes were the very last thing she did on the painting and she wasn't happy with it and so she erased the eyes and she went to sleep that night and her husband woke her up in the morning and told her how beautiful the painting was and how beautiful the eyes were and she was like wait I didn't do the eyes I didn't finish the eyes so the eyes somehow miraculously was complete and when you go see this painting now it's very lifelike, it's very moving. So that pilgrimage was maybe 20 minutes away. So the, some kind of a movement, going to the sacred. You have to begin somewhere, kind of like life. I mean, um, I think one of the interesting things for me here was when I went up Cross Mountain. I think for different reasons, the different spaces and places here are very unique, but that one, it's a difficult hike up that uh, mountain. Um, you know, when you first get here, too, we're, we, I think we, by nature, we seek out, you know, we want a nice flat path. We want an easy road. We don't want to have to struggle so much. And so when I first got here, it was one of the first things I did. And it was like, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't realize the struggle of what it would be to go up uh, kind of navigating. And it almost seemed impossible. If you look too far ahead, it's like, man, I don't even know how that's possible, right? So you really have to recalibrate your spirit. And this is where like praying the rosary kind of goes up. You get into prayer while you're doing it. And it really just becomes like your next step or your next two or three steps. And you have to stay in that place the entire way up, you know. Um, I remember a few times I would like stop and like look around and I couldn't believe how much progress I had made. It almost didn't like make sense. It felt like it was faster than what the experience really was going up right mm -hmm. um so there's some kind of a recalibration and i think i think that particular journey up cross mountain taught me a lot about life because we almost have to look at life like this life is full of you know struggles and hardships and sufferings um it's probably why a lot of people why they come here you know i've talked to some 
some older women that have had some struggles in their life. Uh, there's a young lady, an older lady I met from Australia, and she was telling me about some of the hardships she's had with her family. Um, yeah, life could be difficult, you know. We suffer a lot. There's something about the comfort of Our Lady, right? Our Mother. Like you asked me earlier, what is, what did she do for me when I was here? It's, in some ways, like she reorganized my spirit. I feel like she almost went into the closet of my soul, and like this, a loving mother would. She kind of washed my clothes and folded my clothes and put everything away neatly in me. I feel recalibrated going back out into the life. Um, there was another experience I had and an insight um, as I've been thinking about kind of Mary and Joseph here, and this was in St. James Church. There's this little boy, um, and his parents, his mother's pregnant with child. The fathers always watch him. They, they, they obviously bring him into church quite a bit because he's right at home. When he gets there, he goes off and he's going up to different people and showing them love in different ways. And people are like giving him the rosary. Like he's just very comfortable in this album. He's probably two years old. Um, but there was one moment when I was kind of noticing him during mass. He would like kind of, he would see his mother from afar and he would he would run like 20 feet into her arms with the greatest look of joy. And then he'd kind of walk away and then he'd turn back. And then he would run again into his mother's arms. It's like, there's something about that that was illuminating kind of um, what it must have been like with Our Lady and her baby Jesus, you know, and that love that they share. So, you know, Father Leon, one of the things I didn't really realize, I guess he had said Our Lady, one of the things that she asked for us people who get to visit here is not just to pray, you know, one set of the mysteries, but to play, pray three mysteries every day. So I've been doing that uh, a bit while I'm here. When I go for my walks and visit the different places, I've been kind of getting into, you know, praying multiple mysteries. And it deepens your faith. It deepens your faith when you start to think about Jesus Christ through Our Lady's love, through a mother's love. Somehow that strengthens the connection that we have to uh, Christ. Um, yeah, it's just been a beautiful journey. I mean, I spent a little time over by the Blue Crosses. That was very interesting for me to spend a little time with my book, doing some writing. Um, very useful because it's maybe not as hard of a hike, so it seems like some people who are maybe a little more infirm or some of the uh, more elderly people, it gives them access to a place that is very tranquil. I believe some apparitions happened there as well at a point in time. So that was just a very restful rest. It was almost like so tranquil there that I like took a nap for like a, an hour and I kind of wake up and like, wow, where am I? And I haven't felt this kind of peace in a long time. So. It's been a really, really rejuvenating um, visit for me here. I'm, I've been here for about six days. Mm -hmm. I'm preparing to head out tonight to go to my next destination. Tonight? I'm tonight. lucky to have met you. Yeah, wow. glad we made it happen. Timothy, I'm really I'm happy to have oh, met you. Thank you. I'm glad to and, spend... And this is the second time or the first time? Did you come last year after Lourdes directly here or did you now the first time here? You no, know, last year um, I spent a lot of time traveling around France, so it was to visit Lourdes, and then also I went to Lisieux to yeah. visit the Carmel with St. Therese, uh, yeah. spent the last portion of her life, and to go to the cathedral there where she had made her first confession as a little girl, and then the big basilica that was built in honor of this uh, simple anonymous nun when she died. You go there and you realize, man, that was... Uh, 30 years after she passed away or so, you know, this big, beautiful place. Very special. I went to Alençon, the, the village where she was born and grew up, and that was very special as well. Uh, like I said, I went to, in uh, Alsace, France. I went to Le Mont Saint Odile. Mm -hmm. So I stayed at the convent up there for a few nights. So I was mostly traveling around France uh, last year. Mm -hmm. But Lourdes is kind of the centerpiece of that experience. Mm -hmm. So having visited that, I've kind of realized like most people go on vacations. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to go on vacations anymore. I want to go on pilgrimages. Um, um, I mean, so what do we do when we go on vacations, right? I mean, we already kind of live in a life that leads us into like 
consumption, consumerism, um, wanting more and more. And you know, when you go on a pilgrimage, you're going to pursue the faith. You're going for faith formation. You're beforehand. You don't really know what's going to happen. You don't really know. I mean, I think when you commit to going to a pilgrimage, you almost have to even question, like, why am I doing this? Like, uh, even though I went to Lourdes before this journey, as I am starting to make the plans, and then you're starting to spend the money to get the tickets lined up. It's like, man, I, I didn't really know. I knew through some of your videos what the testimony were and some of your walks around, like, yeah, this is a place I want to come experience, um, to see, to feel, to have the feelings. Um, and I'm still understanding it. Uh, it's really neat the way the people from Ireland are called here specifically in a special way, I think. So I've been asking some uh, Irish people why that is, you know? Why is there such a strong pull for people from Ireland to come here? Um, but yeah, pilgrimage. I why, mean, why is that called? What did they answer? What's that? What did they answer? Uh, they, they told me... So in Ireland, a lot of the people, I think their grandparents and the generations prior were really Catholic, but something kind of happened there. Yeah. I think a lot of people went away from the faith. Um, and some of it is like their politics. Same things happen in the United States. You know, there's, we forget the lessons of the past. Um, like even this place is very interesting. The political, you can feel the memory of like a socialist, communist background. And I think in those kind of systems, if you study like Marx, you kind of realize that there's no room for God. God has to be on the outside. There has to be dependence upon the government for all your answers, not God. You know, so God becomes a threat. Um, so I think a lot of that in very recent times has been happening in Ireland. Mm -hmm. But that from what they told me, uh, a few of the people that I've talked to, is Our Lady is speaking to them because the Irish people are going to have one of the great roles in the future, you know? for kind of waking the world back up to the what's important, uh, the sacred, the divine. Um, so yeah, kind of learning from that. What is the sacred and divine for you? What You're is the it? sacred and divine? The yeah. is to encounter the sacred and divine. Yeah, I mean, so in our ordinary lives, right? Um, I mean, I'm lucky. I, I, I was around my grandfather who was a saint, so I learned a lot from him about kind of putting myself around the sacraments and the church. My mother kind of put me in a situation when I was a little boy that I would see him singing. And, but, you know, as I got into my 20s, we go to school. You know, a lot of times when we're in school, um, we go away from that. We go away from kind of uh, the church and the sacraments because this is what society tells us. Um, you know, you go to the university, it's everything other than kind of uh, the sacred and the divine, like we were saying. Um, yeah, I was very lucky to spend some time in South Dakota with the Lakota Sioux people, mm -hmm. with Chief Dave Bald Eagle and Morris and Bonita Little Shield. So he was a holy man. And when I seen, I got to be around those people, they're very spiritual too. You know, the way they would sing their songs, their prayer songs. and give thanks to the Creator. There's a prayer that they have, Mitakie Oyasin, mm -hmm. which means all my relations. I am related to all that is. So I remember one warrior, Amos, he, told, he gave me some advice. He's like, you know, go back home and, and learn your way. Learn the way of your people. Learn the heritage that was handed to you. <coughs> and so that always stuck with me. I think even when he said it, I was like, man, there's something about that, you know? Um, so I went through a little period in my late 20s. Uh, I think, we, you know, we all have to come to a, a point of like conversion, adult mm -hmm. conversion. Mm -hmm. Even if we're baptized and brought up in the church, it can become very passive for us. And it's just something we do as a matter of routine, you know, going to church and taking communion. Maybe we lose sense of the reverence. Um, so when I, I had this conversion after a few years of, you know, uh, kind of doing the wrong things, maybe being influenced by some drugs, walking the streets in the middle of the night, being around. Uh, I remember one time I was with my father. We we're both in this period together at one point. It was four in the morning in the west side of Chicago. Um, 
going to look for like the next fix, all right? And I heard this voice in my ear. I believe it was an angel, my guardian angel. Like, why? You know, why? Why are you doing this? Um, it wasn't too long after that. There was a gentleman who kept reaching out to me. He kept trying to get me to commit. Come to church with me. Come to church with me. Come to church with me, you know. And I, I finally did. I finally did. I remember one of the readings was from the book of Timothy that day. And that moment is like all these remembrances came back of my childhood and those feelings I had when I would go to St. William's Church where my grandfather was. And, you know, at that point, my grandfather, he was uh, getting to be about 90. Um, and so he started to need help to get to church every week along with my grandma Katie. So it became part of my responsibility to get them to church. Um, and so that's a discipline too. You know, some of us, you know, there's a lot of Catholics who just go for Easter and Christmas every year, you know, kind of go twice or go for a family baptism. So one of the lessons I learned it wasn't always something I wanted to do, right? Maybe I was up late night the, the night before, I had wake up and had a headache, or it was the middle of winter, you wake up and it's still dark, but I knew that my grandparents were waiting on me. I knew that they were depending on me to get them to church. So somehow through that exercise, every time I would get there, no matter, some, usually it was the times that it was more difficult, initially like, oh, I don't want to do this, but you would end up there in the setting of church, right? It's like, man, why was this so hard? Why wouldn't I want to do this? Um, yeah. So it was a lesson. It was a lesson I learned. Uh, and then after my grandfather and grandmother kind of passed on, that lesson was internalized in me. And now I almost can't get enough on weekends. I have three churches in my community that I go to regularly. I recently joined a choir. I always sang because my grandfather was a singer, you know, so those who sing pray twice, you know, that old, yeah. uh, one of the great singings, I think. Um, so I always sang with choirs. You could sing anywhere. You don't have to be in a choir. You could always harmonize with people. I've been doing a bit of that with uh, some of the music directors here at St. James Church, um, trying to understand that songs are a little bit different here, but I, over the course of the week, I've been kind of picking up uh, some of that lingo but yeah learning uh that's part of like going back to like the Lakota soon we talk about the divine and the sacred you know songs of praise songs of worship you know it really prepares us to pray when we sing you know and when you're saying the words and you're feeling the words and you kind of bring that from deep down yeah, it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing to sing in houses uh of the lord um yeah, I never want to go away from that. I got some rosaries while I'm here when I, for this new choir that I just, it's the first time I officially joined the choir. Yeah. Um, and it's older people. And there's probably about four older ladies, uh, one older gentleman, and then there's the organist, Jeff. Um, he learned it, how to play the organ from someone before him who's no longer with us. And he learned at grassroots. He's not a professional musician, but I've been watching him play and it's almost like a whole body kind of thing they have to do to play the organ. Um, so sometimes while we're singing, I've only been doing this with them for about a month now. I, I almost have to like stop and like look over, like how is this, this beautiful, we're creating like this beautiful like prayer through song. Like it's, and I've been feeling that here too kind of looking around at some of the songs in St. James, it's a feeling I've had here that something that's kind of worked on me just this last week is, yeah, facing the altar and facing, you know, the priest and the Eucharist and all that. But also we should stop to take a, when we ask our brothers and sisters, you know, uh, to kind of pray for you, my brothers and sisters, pray for me to the Lord our God. It's very inspiring for me to just kind of turn and look and see all the people and see how everyone's in silence. The look of adoration on people, the sense of reverence. You could read it on people's faces. Um, the sacred and divine. I mean, you could, we could feel it through our brothers and sisters. We're very lucky to be part of this one Catholic and universal church because you could go anywhere in the world. I mean, I'm lucky that where I live in Chicago, and in Michigan City, Indiana, that 
there's churches all over. As part of that is a legacy of like these immigrants from you know 100, 120 years ago. In Chicago, if you you could walk kind of like Rome, you know, every two blocks there's another church. Um, so you could go there and you could kind of feel different communities and different groups of people singing. Sometimes it's an organ. The lady here, she plays a violin very nicely. Um, I mean, music is a really good entry point into uh, feeling the sacred and the divine. So Saint Cecilia, you know, pray for us. Um, yeah. Beautiful what you say. Yeah. You talked about confession. Can you explain people? You're an expert on confession. We talked before. What would you tell people who are scared to go to confession? Think it's a dark hole, Middle Ages, the priest, chastisement, yeah. chastisement, you call it. Yeah. I, I felt that way for a long time myself. Um, again, my grandfather, Harry, he, uh, I always noticed he went to confession. That was always a big part of his Catholic experience and the way he practiced his faith. Um, yeah, part of it is, yeah, I think we hear the Protestant voices sometimes, a kind of question, you don't need to confess to another man for forgiveness. You can just go directly to the source, you know, the kind of the Protestant motifs. Um, it's a little bit scary too to go and yeah. to confess our sins, to say, to ask for forgiveness. You know, when you think of like the, the, the confessional and you're getting on your knees in a dark place, mm -hmm. yeah, that could be a little bit intimidating. Um, over the course of the last year, I began to want to like work on this and make this a part of my experience, it's a sacrament, right? We only have so many sacraments and the sacraments are all sacred and divine and very beautiful. So Our Lady of Fatima, once a month, first Saturdays, going to confessions. It seems to be a good cadence for how often to do it because that was another thing. Okay, I want to go to confession. How often do I go to confession? So then I discovered once a month seems to be a really nice way to do that. Um, yeah, so going into confession I, I, I always like I was telling you earlier I always want to like I would go in and it's like I want to make the best confession ever and I get in there and sometimes it could be very easy to talk about like other people or it could you know be about feelings or not things that are sins I mean again I've, I was thinking of like St. Therese of Lisieux I have to think very a very small little thing almost like a little child like go in there with one little tangible thing to ask for forgiveness for that, you know? Um, I remember very early on in the confessions, when I'd walk out of confession, mm -hmm. it was one of the most amazing feelings. You get like, this great weight has been lifted off of your shoulders. Um, it just feels good. It feels good to be forgiven. Um, it's something I still work on I, I, when I go in I prepare myself beforehand, I get into prayer, I examine my conscience. I've confessed here three times over the last six days, so every two days, and you know, they feel connected, you know, and I ask the priest, how to better, how do I make a good confession, Father? And you know, they'll give you guidance, they'll coach you up in there, and they'll, you know, kind of give you some strategies. And one of the things, one of the priests that stood with me that he said was, you know, examine your relationships. It's a really good entry point into getting, um, when we start to think deeply about how we relate to, you know, it could be our relatives, it could be our parents, it could be our brothers or sisters, it could be friends, it could be even just people that we see on the streets that are in need, you know? Do we choose to be charitable? You know, maybe I didn't choose to be charitable because I don't want to give that person money, so maybe I was a little bit greedy. Um, so that could be something that's weighing on, you know, my mind that I want to get off my shoulders. It could be, you know, uh, the relationships in my family, maybe not telling them I love them enough. Um, it could be a relationship to Jesus Christ even, you know. Um, how do you pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ? And are you doing it the right way? Are you putting yourself regularly in the sacraments, you know, um, you know, a lot of people will go up and we talk about the sacredness and kind of reverence and, you know, the divine. The greatest thing we do is kind of the sacrifice of the mass, right? It's the Eucharist. Can you explain that? I mean, I'm still learning about everything, 
we should always be learning. We should always be continuing to, to form our faiths within us. But yeah, the greatest thing. So there's something in the United States right now. There's two uh, priests that are really great. Bishop uh, Barron mm -hmm. and then uh, Father Mike Schmitz. Mm -hmm. And Bishop Barron had this idea three years ago to do this Eucharistic revival. And it's going on for three years and it's going to culminate in a National Eucharistic Congress. The first time in 80 years in the United States and it'll be in Indianapolis this summer. Um, and the, the reason for this Eucharistic revival is because I guess they had done some uh, polling of Catholics. Many Catholics don't believe that in the Eucharist the body and blood of Jesus Christ is really present, that he's really present with us. They think that it's symbolic. Um, and if you don't believe that it's the real presence of Jesus Christ among you, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point of the Mass. Can you explain? <coughs> very important here. Yeah, very important. So Jesus Christ is made present among us in the real flesh and the real body. It started with what he said at the Last Supper, do this in memory of me. In those times, people probably didn't, you know, at that Last Supper, people, they probably didn't understand what he was saying, even when he talked about, they will eat my flesh. Like, what is this crazy man talking about? Here we are 2,000 years later. Every single Mass, both here in Mezhigoria and around the world in every Catholic church, our priests, with their hands, are going through the prayers and the transubstantiation to make Jesus Christ really present among us. You know, another, this happened to me in Lourdes too. I, I never really understood adoration. I always kind of uh, noticed, you know, growing up or in church, it would be like old ladies in adoration, right? Um, it didn't, didn't really like hit me. I didn't really grasp the significance or the beauty of spending time in adoration. There was a moment in Lourdes, I think it was in the, uh, the rosary, the big rosary church, which I think is down in the bottom. Um, and there was just a moment sitting there in adoration where the Eucharist was displayed in the monstrance. I mean, how beautiful is it to sit quietly in the presence of Jesus Christ? Um, it's a, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, and probably most Catholics, we probably don't do enough of that. We probably, you know, it's one thing to go through the Mass and everything, but outside of the Mass, we should probably try to spend a little bit of time in adoration. We should probably spend a little bit of time, not even actively in prayer, just being quiet, spending time with Jesus. You know, this is a very important way that nourishes our soul that I think most Catholics kind of, um, it's beyond us. I mean, unless someone teaches us, right? I think a lot of us don't have great teachers. This is where, you know, we could read books, but I think, you know, coming to places like this, going on pilgrimage, um, this is faith formation coming to places like this. This is faith formation. Seeing, I've seen more people walking around with either wearing their rosaries, which I thought I was one of the only people who do this. Everyone does it here. And everyone's got a rosary in their hand. And it's just a very interesting way to, it's only gonna be in places like this where Our Lady's doing like her work, right? Um, and why here? You, you know, I know everyone always questions, like, why, why are these specific places? I think this is a place, this was a communist place, right? This was a war-torn country for a long time. Even very recently, one of the ladies in one of the shops is telling me in the 90s there was a lot of conflicts here between kind of the Muslims and the Catholics and the different groups and ethnicities. Um, and we're dealing with this a little bit right now in our own politics in the United States, where the, people forget the lessons that we learned, you know. Go back and read some of the things that John Paul II had to say about communism. Read some of the things that, uh, that happened uh, over the last 80 to 100 years and the influence communism has had in our world. Again, it takes people away from God. Um, so she appeared to these young children, the visionaries, right? She always appears to the young, innocent children. It's very amazing uh, how and why that happens. And then in a place like this, that has this kind of history here, like, yeah, why not here? Why wouldn't Our Lady do work here, right? Um, and now, you know, one of the priests in one of his homilies, he said, he was telling us, the people, the pilgrims, like you, the pilgrims, you're the apparition. 
So in some ways, like she, be, Our Lady begins her work in these places, and then people come from all over the world. I mean, that's the most amazing thing. It's the most amazing thing. Um, yeah, a bit of this. Uh, same thing in Lourdes. Like sometimes people like to compare these Marian apparition sites, and yeah, this one is still active. The church hasn't uh, made it an official site yet. Uh, some of the visionaries are still having messages from Our Lady, so it's very interesting. But Lourdes, yeah, Saint Bernadette Subaru is no longer alive, but it's still an active place too because there's still miracles happening there. There's still conversions happening there. There's still people being healed here. And that's happening here as well. So you can't come to a place like this and hear people's stories and testimonies and to see people on their knees and see the reverence in their face for the sacred and the divine without it moving in your spirit, without it moving in your soul, right? Um, man, it, even though I had that Lord's experience, there was a point where, you know, as I said, was I was planning this trip here, so you have to, you, you'll always get to the question, why? Why am I doing this, you know? Man, it's always so worth it. Like, don't wait. I mean, especially if you're healthy, do it. But even if you're not healthy, I've seen people here that, uh, I've seen a gentleman today, he had about four of his family members helping him get up Apparition Hill, and yeah, he couldn't even walk on his own. Um, I've seen, Going up Cross Mountain uh, the other day, there was a gentleman who had uh, an infant child in his arms, all the way to the top. Um, yeah, you can't come to a place like this and not be moved. I mean, yeah, this is Our Lady's work. This is what she's doing. Uh, she's moving people? Or what is the work she's doing? The work she's doing here is she's preparing us. She's, I think... Uh, Father Leon said it really well. I really enjoyed his little talks that he gives right before Mass. He kind of really will ground us as pilgrims into what the experience, and he kind of focuses it on us and what we should be focused on. But one of the things he said that stood out to me was like, this isn't like some Mediterranean holiday. You're in spiritual boot camp, and Mary's our general. So, I mean, I think we, people all over the world feel it's, you know, we're getting to a point in time where something's happening, you know, we're getting to the point with the threat of wars and, you know, people questioning the you know, global warming and just all the different struggles and violence. Um, you know, Christ will come again. This is what we believe, right? And Our Lady, the way she keeps working in apparitions, she's the one who's going to crush the head of the serpent. She has a very, very important role to play in the very end. So I think when she, she does her, her work in these little places, it's a way of kind of forming the people of God. It's a way of kind of giving us an opportunity to feel her love, one, but also to be able to kind of form our faith in a deeper way that prepares us. It prepares us for end times, you know, and also gives us the ability to kind of help pass this on to those around us and to give encouragement to others, to, you know, those who are down or maybe those who are afraid, you know. You always ask people what's their favorite scripture. One of mine that I've thought about a lot lately that like comes up over and over throughout the New Testament is be not afraid, you know. 365 times in the Bible for every day. Times. Yeah, that's amazing. Because it blocks us from God, I see it. People right. don't give testimony, they're afraid. But right. they're blocking something. Maybe somebody had to listen to their story. Right. Sometimes it feels so sad. Yeah. But, but you don't judge because I had the, the fear, I didn't do things, you know? Yeah. But I sometimes it's sad because man, she had a story. I'd love, love, love to listen. I don't listen. Love to listen to your story. Right. So no fear for you then? Yeah, time. no fear. I mean, yeah, at times we still may feel fear, but. By putting ourselves in the sacraments, you open yourself up to grace. You know, ask Our Lady for her graces. You know, as uh, in my travels in France last year, I was very lucky to visit the uh, the Chapel of the Miraculous Medal, wow. uh, Rue de Bac in Paris. Yeah. In Paris. And um, that experience is very special. Um, 
that church and there's another church nearby called Notre Dame de Victoire, mm -hmm. also very special. But St. Catherine Labouré and her kind of visitations with yeah, me, I think she had... You have it in the hand, no? no I do have it in my hand. Just to show it to people, get yeah. that one at your priest and wear it, always have it, always, especially in these times with you. Yeah. Keep on going, just to... Very obey. simple prayer. Yeah. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So in the medal, Our Lady has her hands out, and there's these colors that kind of come out of her hands. I think in one of the, her third vi visitation with Mary, I think um, she asked, Catherine Liberty asked Our Lady, like, she could see like the colored gems in her hands, but there's a few that the light wasn't coming out of. So she asked her, her mother, like, what is that? Or why is it? And she, Our Lady said, basically, those are graces that no one has asked me for. Mm -hmm. So the graces are there. We just have to ask for them. Um, yeah. Don't forget that. Please ask. Our God wants a relationship like between a woman and a man. Communication, communication. He wants to be loved. That right. we delight in him. That's what I learned lately. Delight in him. Just be, not even thanking. Just be, wow, God's so nice to be with you. And then naturally comes to thank you for stuff. No? Yeah. I mean, before Enjoy this. Showing God. You know, the showing God, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before this visit over here, I was over by that statue. Yeah. Where Jesus, uh, his wounded, yeah, it's um, it's something. I've spent a little bit of time there. The birds sing that seems sweeter. They mm -hmm. sing sweeter in that area. Mm -hmm. The sun shines a little more warmly in that area. But if you kind of just, it's one thing when you go up. Like when I first went up, it was like I don't know if I'm going to see anything, right? We always doubt. I think it's natural to want to doubt. Uh, we want to see evidence. I um, mm -hmm. got up and I, I saw it. I saw something that I can't explain. Um, beyond that though, I've, I've continued to go back there and I just would kind of sit off to the side and just kind of take in watching the people kind of go up there. And a, a place like that or something special is happening like that, it deepens people's love. It gives them, I was seeing people consoling Jesus. I was seeing them feeling his pain, nothing more than feeling the love of Christ. Very special spot there. There's so many special places here in Mejigoria. I, uh, I think my, in my spirit the last week, even though I know that I'm leaving tonight, uh, I've been like internally, I feel like my spirit is trying to figure out, man, I want to stay, can I stay another week or another month? I want to live here, you know, it's... Uh, but I know that's not going to happen. But I do hope I can make it back one day in my lifetime. Um, but if I don't, I'll take this back with me, back to where I'm from, and I'll tell this story. Because I remember that's something you hear a lot when you read about Medjugorje. I think this is part of it is because it's still an active place. There's a lot of people that question um, the authenticity of it. But if you come here, there's no way you cannot be moved by all the people that are that are praying. There's no way that you could climb up, you know, Apparition Hill and see the kinds of people that are, you know, struggling their way up there regardless of what their ailments are or how old they are even or how young they are. Um, there's no way that people are coming from around the world here to be with Our Lady and to be with her son. Right, and you're not gonna, there's no way your spirit won't be moved by that, by the witness of that. Um, yeah, so beautiful. Yeah. And coming back to your grandfather, what did he give you as an advice, Catholic? What is the why was he Catholic? Did you talk to him? Yeah, I, I did talk to him. I mean, and he your was, grandfather as well, Both yeah, your grandmother as well. I mean, um, they were a consistent influence throughout my life, they were a witness for me to see the people who held the church and held, particularly my grandfather Harry with Our Lady, like the Blessed Mother as he would call her. I remember he would told me, this is before I kind of even realized the significance of it. And I think back now and I remember the times he told me about like Lourdes and Fatima, particularly Fatima for his generation, I think was a really, really big one. I remember he shared with me this book, I still have it to this day, that shows some of the pictures from Fatima. And you could see like the pilgrims looking up 
at the miracle of the sun. I mean, yeah, he, uh, all those things, his, he got it from his mother. You know, he, um, he would tell me stories of when he was a little boy, he would get, his mother would dress him all up and you would go through the processions to the neighborhood. Um, I think when he was growing up, the church was a little more kind of uh, present in the neighborhood maybe than it is now. Um, you know, he went through the changeover too. He came up with uh, the Latin Mass and he lived through that period where kind of the Vatican II and things changed. And that was a little bit difficult on him, but he didn't dwell on it. He carried on. He embraced it out of obedience to the church. Um, and I think it was 2014, we, we slightly changed the Mass again and to be a little more accurate to the original wording. And at his advanced stage at that point, that was a little bit difficult for him. But you know, he embraced it and he learned the new phrases. Instead of in peace with you, in peace be with your spirit. You know, little changes, but when these things become ingrained, you kind of become attached, right? But he didn't hold on. Uh, I see a lot of that now with our church. That, I mean, we're not Protestants today. We shouldn't have these kinds of divisions or arguments among each other of, you know, the trads, the traditionals versus the uh, the Vatican tours, the, the Novus Ordo. I mean, get in where you fit in in our church. Our church expresses itself in so many beautiful ways. I think right now the church in Africa, there's this priest I follow um, on social media, and it's very, he's in Malawi. He, he, it's very interesting the way the church expresses itself there, the way the people sing it. It's such a joyful expression. Um, and very, he calls it like our, our African basilicas. And in the, in the middle of their communities, they're using sticks and logs and branches and creating a place. And man, how lovely is that to see, you know, we have these big, beautiful basilicas in our churches, but we also have these very simple, almost like huts which is also part of the Catholic faith. Um, we could learn the Latin Mass and we could share that in common, but we could also go to meet, like when I was traveling around France last year, I don't speak f French, but I could still understand the movements of the Mass yeah. because I spent enough time in my own faith formation back home that I understand the order of the Mass. Yeah, and so same thing here with the International Mass every night. Um, yeah, you could put the radio on and you could follow along in your translation, but you don't even need to do that. You could kind of, you could understand the movements of the mass, and sometimes it's beautiful to hear the mass in another language. These are languages are beautiful. Um, so many beautiful languages. I mean, there's there's no other faith like ours. I mean, we're the most inclusive religion. Absolutely, everyone is welcome. Yeah. Right? Yes. Anyone could convert. Anyone could have a conversion of heart. Yeah you know, and come to believe. Amen. Yeah, amen. And that's, we have to make it clear because the media is projecting that we are total extremists and we, we are exclusive yeah. and it's a lie. It's yeah. not the truth. We hate the sin and it sounds middle age, but it means unlove and hate, greed. That's what we hate and we try to get it out of our lives. Yeah. And that's the truth, what it's really about. Yeah. We have to get it back. We have to have also to gain crown. Pub. Christ died in public. So right. you have to stand up for Christ in public as well. That's right. what I read on Facebook today. He, he was dying in a little room, not offending anybody, publicly right. visible for everybody. Yeah. And the earth was shaking. Right. The, the holiest of holy, the, the curtain split apart. Everything right. became public visible. You know? Yeah, all of creation reacted. All uh, of creation reacted to it. You know? It's yeah. so beautiful what you said. And yeah. what do you take home now from Metzegoya, leaving tonight? Um, I take home a, a profound sense of peace. You know, uh, you try to always kind of keep that with you when you visit sacred places, whether it's your local church or a local shrine of some sort, or if you get to visit somewhere in the world, particularly in Medjugorje, I think the feeling I'll take back from here is just this deep sense of motherly love. Um, a deep sense of love for praying the rosary. Um, a sense of the sacred and divine, like we said earlier, and the way that plays out in our brothers and sisters. And those are the people next to us in the pews in our churches. Those are the people that live in our communities, in our neighborhoods. People who are praying,
quietly in their own hearts, you know, with uh, their own rosary, or those who get together in big groups and pray and sing together. Uh, yeah. I'll take this story home with me. I'll share it with as many people as I can. Yeah. And that's uh, why they should come to Medjugorje to experience that as well? Yeah. I, it, I can't imagine having come here and after asking myself why I was coming here. Your videos really helped a lot. You know, hearing people's plain testimonies, that kind of gave me an idea of what this place is. And then also your walking tours kind of helped illuminate it for me. If I just went by what's on the media, the thing when we, we look things up on the internet is for any one thing, we could find 50 different um, talking points. Um, so I think in that way, you're not really gonna get with Medjugorje is uh, you almost have, people will tell you, you'll hear it from someone. People might give you a little encouragement or you'll come across someone who yeah, I've heard since people back home, when they knew that I was coming here, I was there and it was a life-changing experience. Nothing was ever the same again. Um, and now having been here myself, it's going to be the same message that I share with people when I go back home. Yeah. Uh, what can I say? Thank you for the beautiful interview. Thank you, Tom.